Okay, you can't sit in your horn, gonna teach at the RD. Good to see you all. Thank you for coming today. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so, welcome back. We're already at week five, day one of our class. It's Tuesday, February 7th already. And it uh, feels like time is flying by. So we have a full class for today. <clears throat> um, I have an announcement about our Friday sessions. And then we're going to continue wrapping up our discussion from Friday. On uh, last Friday, Shak Sani Keek shared a lot about nutrition in traditional Shinget foods. And uh, we're going to continue that. And then if you had questions or comments from last Friday, we'll make space for you to ask those questions in class. Um, and so that'll be fun. And then we'll do pronunciation practice. It's really important to um, distinguish between the different X sounds, uh, whether it's a regular X, pinch, underline. So we'll practice that today. And then I'll send you with some practice sheets you can use. And then we're going to jump into Shingit Einachsa. So that means say it and sing it. It's the title of the phrase book that was published by Sea Alaska Heritage. It was compiled by the Dauenhauers. And it'll be a focus reference book for our coming month of classes. Uh, excellent resource. So we're going to continue using that today. Um, if there's time, we'll continue our discussion about the phrases, and then we'll send you off with your homework. So first off for the class announcement, if you're able to come this Friday, uh, we're very excited to announce that we'll be including representation on our Friday sessions of different ways of speaking Tlingit. Um, in the interior, in different communities. And so even if we don't have a fluent speaker from that particular area, we do have people that can introduce recordings just so that you can hear the different sounds, the different ways of speaking Shinget and start to become familiar with them. So this Friday we'll do inland Shinget. Our guest speaker will be Hone. And I'm excited to have him in class. He's done a lot of um, really good work with speakers from inland and uh, he'll introduce some recordings. So that'll be this Friday. Hope you can make it. And <clears throat> we're gonna continue on with our discussion of Tlingit foods. So go ahead and open up your notes from Friday. Uh, if you don't have a copy open, I'll just link it in the chat for you so that you can start your copy. But this is a compilation of traditional Shinget foods in Southeast uh, that Shaksani Keek made and has shared with us. So here's the link in the chat. It'll look like this. And then if you haven't already, what you're looking at now is my personalized copy. So if you open up your document in the link I just shared, um, you'll be able to view it, but not edit it. So to make it editable, you go file, make a copy, name it uh, with your own name, and then select make a copy. And now you have your own editable version. Are there any questions on that before we get started? I'll also share the link to mine, which I think, I think it's the one I put in there. Copy link, okay, I'll put this in the chat as well. And other than that, I'll hand it over to Chef Sani Keek. Yeah, I wanted to uh, take a minute or so to finish up. Uh, calcium uh, is the importance of, of it having us having it 
uh, is so important and the things that it does in our bodies. I don't know if I mentioned the fact that uh, it helps uh, with, uh, in regards to your uh, blood pressure. And, and when you hear the word help, that means that, uh, that it, it, it is uh, part of the assistance of uh, your body working together uh, to keep you healthy. And I think it, it also helps to uh, protect you uh, from cancer. And uh, uh, the <clears throat> importance of, of calcium is really great because uh, we, we don't have uh, any source of, of milk except uh, from, from mother's milk. After that, we, we have uh, other sources cooking with bones and stuff. And uh, if you are a, a great uh, drinker of milk, uh, then you're, you've got a, a lot of sources. And what happens is you have all the calcium you need, like uh, my son that was here earlier, uh, he always drinks, we, we, when he was young, and we'd go to a restaurant, he'd always order two cartons of milk to drink. And the waitresses never really believed him. So we always had to send for the second carton. Uh, so I don't think that he would have uh, any problems. In fact, if you have uh, too much calcium, your body has to uh, get rid of the extra. But if you don't have enough and you're allergic to milk, uh, like a lot of people are, um, it, it's really difficult for your body to make, even make any use of, of calcium you might ingest. Uh, so uh, uh, I was told by some people, Oh, well, you know, calcium appears in uh, in leafy vegetables, which is true. Uh, if, if it was analyzed, uh, there is calcium available in that. The problem is it's difficult for your body to extract that calcium for its own use. So the chances are great that it's not going to do it. So uh, if you're uh, allergic to, to milk to even think about talking about it, um, you might try goat's milk. People that are allergic to cow's milk uh, can take uh, goat's milk. And my husband is a great, has a, a real preference for goat's milk. So, it's always uh, available in our refrigerator. And uh, uh, my son, my oldest son uh, wanted to experiment. So he poured some in cups and tried to uh, mix the cups around to, uh, to see which one was cow's milk and which was, was goat's milk. It was hard to tell. So he tasted it taste test tasted uh, the milk and he said can't tell the difference tastes the same and they also add vitamin d to it so it, it's a good source uh for milk if you want to try it it's expensive but as an adult uh you you don't need to ingest that much milk anymore, but you do need to continue to have it because uh, the calcium has a lot of work to do. In fact, they can test your blood to see if you have enough calcium in your blood for it to be working. Uh, it does, actually your body will kind of grab on to every bit of calcium 
that you have from uh, uh, bones and cooking with bones and uh, shellfish and things like that. Um, it will grab onto every bit of calcium that you can get to use for your body. Uh, I, I think I mentioned before that uh, young ladies that are pregnant, make, uh, and if you have a chance to advise them to make sure they uh, drink milk because the baby will take uh, calcium from them and it's not good for them to to uh, to lose that calcium from their bones. I hope I have everything covered. I quickly had to go over iron. So the seal meat is a, all meats are really good source, especially the liver is a good source of iron. And all meats that are dark, uh, like the seal, very, very dark because it has to store iron in its body. And iron carries oxygen, and that's why it's important to have iron. So uh, uh, the sources are from the fat, the meat of seal, liver, uh, deer liver, heart and uh, kidneys, and um, uh, bone marrow is an excellent source. That's kind of hard to get. So it's really enjoyable when you do get it and you feel like it. So um, I want to invite you to ask questions. And if I I don't know the answer, I will uh, find out for you. So then we'll both get educated. So if you want to go ahead and, and ask uh, questions. I had a question because like I was really interested in calcium and how you mentioned you can take it from fish as well if you leave the fish bones closer to the meat for longer periods of time when you process it. And so what are some of the ways you can do that? Uh, we were talking about chowder earlier. Uh -huh. You make a, a chowder and put the uh, backbone of the of the fish uh, and when when it's cooked the meat that's on the backbone will fall off real easy so after it's cooked then you can just fish out the bones the backbone and throw it away okay calcium will also leach into the into the soup um, the other uh, the other way is uh Fish head soup mm. that has a lot of calcium in it. To uh, people kind of think it's strange to eat fish head soup, but it's actually very delicious mm -hmm. uh, because you have to cook the bones, and it it takes quite a while to cook it. Um, and uh, forget about meatless or boneless meat because it just uh, it, it, it's a gadget they use to sell their meat. Uh, so if you get a deer or you get a moose, uh, make sure that uh, you uh, hang on to the bones, the long bones, and cook them. It takes quite a while to cook it, quite a long time, like an hour or two mm. to uh, cook it to season it and uh, the stew meat, uh, I, I, I've gotten deer meat, stew uh, meat, and it's all meat, no bones whatsoever. Mm. So, you know, uh, we're all getting to the place where we're being sold on the idea of take the meat and throw it, take the bones and throw it away, you know. 
<laughs> any of those sauces, it depends on how you cook. And uh, uh, you also get uh, calcium from shellfishes. I know not everybody was here on Friday for our discussion about foods, but um, feel free to ask questions. There's no wrong questions. You can just raise your hand or unmute your mic if you have any questions about foods, or nutrition. Any questions on on the food list that I, I might have missed? Asking yata. Uh -huh. I was wondering, um, it would be fun to take this list and then find the clinket words that that work for it. And then um, and then also go back and forth with it. In a cheese. Ah, you can. That's an awesome idea. Yeah. Uh, the thing about the food list is uh, it's just a list of the food sources that we have, and uh, it, there's no, I didn't include any information on how to cook it, or how to fix it, and how we used it, because it's kind of another discussion altogether. And uh, so in talking about uh, cooking the backbones and uh, other parts that has uh, has the calcium and whatever is needed is in there, uh, that's not part of the, uh, part of the list. Uh, so it, it, I think it, that at one time uh, I had a class that where uh, they, the students got, took uh, groups of the food and uh, worked on making the uh, the names and uh, also the foods that you can make out of it, like chowders and fish head soup and um, or the deer uh, seal meat, how you can cook it. So uh, yeah, it's that is a an important part of of the uh, nutrition. Getting the nutrition is to know how to fix the, the food and uh, I don't I, I'm not sure if there's a uh, cookbook that tells you I, I think of some groups that have tried to do that so because uh, a, a lot of people have difficulty especially like uh, trying to cook the uh, uh, salmon eggs and that takes quite a while, you know. To, it's amazing because the eggs are kind of small, but it takes quite a while to cook it. So, uh, to make the soup. <clears throat> okay. What other questions do folks have? Anything on the list that um, hasn't been covered yet you want to know about? Some of them I had to really just go through real fast and um, and uh, didn't cover like uh, Dungeness crab. We just ate it right out of the shell. We didn't after it was cooked. So uh, any recipes for that, I can't tell you. And and the ducks, uh, the only way I ever tasted it, I, I heard on TV yesterday that there's 440 ways to cook uh, ducks. I think it was they said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only way I know is, is my mom used to cut it up into pieces and throw it in a pot and mix stew. And that was so delicious, so great. Just mm -hmm. loved it. 
So I, I, any other uh, recipes you might want to try to apply some of the new recipes that appear on uh, online. Yeah, somebody mentioned in the chat, this is wonderful information. I love to be able to go back and reference this material. Is anyone aware of a Thinget cookbook? I think Huna uh, uh, tried to do that. Now I can't even remember the source. It might be, it might be Marlene Johnson. I'm, I'm not sure if she uh, was involved in that or not. I, I can't really remember about how to, how to cook certain things. Mm -hmm. So, um, some of, of it, like salmon eggs, uh, we we make, we fermented, which means uh, same thing as stink eggs. Mm -hmm. We just call it that. And uh, you don't cook that. You uh, you just let it sit for a certain number of days. Make sure it's not tightly covered, otherwise you're gonna be poisoned. Mm. Uh, it's uh, important. It is important to know how to to do those. Like I mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, berries that has to be cooked before you can eat it. Mm -hmm. The Alderwood uh, berries. It has to be cooked before you, you can eat it. Uh, so there's things like that that uh, you do have to know. Uh, but a lot of it is not complex. Uh, uh, seal meat, salmon, halibut, uh, clams. Uh, we had a discussion about clams earlier. Uh, as, as a child, we never ate clams without seeing it. In other words, we didn't eat the steamed clams, never. We always uh, crack them open and see if they're healthy and uh, nice and strong moving. Uh, so you can uh, keep that. But if you open it and, and they're just kind of not fighting you, uh, then that, that's one that you probably need to throw out. Mm. Get poison. Mm. And uh, time of the year, the uh, take clams is in southeast is uh, in the months that are that have ours. No clams. I I was really shocked to find out people get clams here in June. Mm. <laughs> Do you want to go? I said no way. You're not supposed to eat clams in the summer. So. Yeah, that's to protect from shellfish poisoning, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just be careful uh, when you use that because uh, if you uh, steam them the, and when it's cooked, they look the same. Uh, so you don't know what which one was the bad one. Hmm. So. Oh, we got some cool comments in the chat about Thinget cookbooks. One was uh, Thinget recipes by Pauline Duncan in Sitka. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know there is one more from from Huna. I thought the uh, ladies got together or somebody got together. And, uh, I wasn't aware of anybody else, but uh, I didn't think to ask. Okay, cool. Someone shared a link to the cookbook by Pauline Duncan, and I just opened it up. So it looks like you can purchase it through the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute store. And that link is in the chat for folks. 
I'd love to see the one by the Huna ladies as well. Okay. Any more questions about uh, nutrition and Tlingit foods? Um, for the salmon, uh, uh, looking up the, the names for them, uh, Sea Alaska really did a, a, a beautiful job on uh, uh, developing units, what they call units for teachers to use. And uh, the very first one I tried uh, of their units was uh, uh, salmon. And what they did was to identify all the salmon and, uh, and talk about, uh, have the students participate in uh, the migration and uh, uh, the knowledge that we have about about uh, salmon when they uh, arrive and when what happens, all those things are, that are important. Um, so uh, they have a lot of really fun projects in that uh, in that unit about salmon, and I'm not really sure uh, what uh, other foods they might have covered because that was a unit I used and I, I really liked it. So I used it a lot. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know if the units are still available. I, I'm just kind of surprised that they let go of a lot of, a lot of things that ended up in Amazon. It looks like they still have their curriculum online, and I just put a link in the chat for folks if you're interested under uh, Thinget Language. They, I found the unit on salmon, so yeah, I do really love these units they put together. Yeah, uh, I think it'd be a good source uh, because uh, of their the way they displayed everything and the names. Uh, that are made available to them. And also it gives you other information about uh, when they arrive and where, you know, different places. So the people in Huna knew that um, the different rivers, that the different salmon go up. So we have five rivers in Huna. And uh, they're named after each one, uh, uh, each kind of fish. So and that's a that's a lot of fun to identify. Yeah, I love that. Hayash, did you have your hand up? I have a, a question. It's sort of a <clears throat> maybe there's an answer to it, maybe not. But um, you know, I, um, I'm just referencing back in. Um, uh, you know, I'm wondering if there's certain types of foods or certain parts of foods that are kind of uh, held out for the for the more um, you know for the elders or for the for a, a powerful person or you know just referencing back, I spent a lot of time in in Samoa and they would give the fish heads to the to the to the chief or to the principal of a school or there was a certain certain foods that would only come about once a year that were highly you know highly sought after and traded and they're just I'm just thinking if there's certain types of food in that we've gone through that are viewed as more special kind of a thing than than others yeah the um the things that shocked me was uh as an elder uh my sons would go down uh one time we went to the Russian river in uh, Kina area, and there was <clears throat> there was just so many people catching, uh, casting and catching salmon. Hmm. And, uh, I I watched uh, really uh, shocked when when I realized they would uh, cut off the head and 
of the tail and the backbone and and take only the the flesh of the salmon, the eggs and everything are tossed. And I could see it flying through the air and I said, oh no. And I, I walked over one time and this uh, two men uh, and uh, one man uh, was trying to help uh, the new guy said, how about, here's how you cut it. And so they, he cut off the head and the tail and threw it in the, in the river and uh, opened up and got the eggs out and threw that out. And then he tried to show him how to cut out the backbone, what made such a mess. So he said, okay, uh, you can try to cut the second one. So he started cutting and he made such a big mess. And <laughs> so uh, I said, can I have the heads? And, and they, guy said oh yeah you can uh after he mangled it to pieces he said here you can just have the whole thing <laughs> eggs and uh backbone and head and everything so i was so happy mm -hmm. and I, I uh took that home and i i made a uh, chowder from the backbone and and the tail and uh and then a fish head, I mean, soup. And then the eggs, I cooked that up and ate it with seaweed. And then the family had the uh, the meat, even though it was really cut up pretty badly. Mm. But, um, yeah, we, we used almost all parts uh, to, uh, when we got it in the, in the elders, it used to be, uh, I would ask people to give me fish heads, but a lot of people now eat it, so uh, I don't get I don't get any hardly. So. It's a good question. I love that. And uh, I wanted to add too. My aunties from Caltech told me uh, whenever I would visit, she would have me help boil beavers' feet because it's really soft. And so we would boil it, peel off the skin and then jar it. And I would bring it back for my grandma who lived in Anchorage. And um, that's a really good one for elders in the interior because it's soft and doesn't irritate your teeth and gums. And But one thing they did say is that women before childbirth should not eat beaver because beaver have a really tight hip area. And so if you eat it, you could have difficult childbirth. Oh. Yeah, some, some of those meats uh, like porcupine and uh, uh, beaver, the meat is extremely bitter because they, they choose to chew on uh, trees. And uh, so, makes it harder to cook and uh, uh, and and to consume it. Um, I think uh, I think that the uh, source of of uh, nutrients that are in it uh, would be hard to uh, identified, I don't know if anybody has ever identified uh, any nutrients that are in there. I just have to be, uh, do some uh, research and try to find out what's in it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think uh, you do have to, uh, I think it's important to, uh, to find out from somebody how to prepare something. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as kids, when we were little girls, uh, we said, oh, we know how to make ink, which is a uh, fermented fish head. So we went to the cannery where some the mothers were working. We got a bucket of uh, heads. We knew how to prepare it. We took the gills out and and 
cut them up like they need to be. And we also knew it was important to uh, line, because we were going to bury it. And uh, it was, we knew it was important to get the scum cabbage leaves ready. And you line the pit and mm -hmm. put the fish heads in there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then cover it with leaves again, and then uh, cover it with the uh, sand or the uh, rocks or whatever you have working with. And uh, three days, you don't, you don't uh, try it before that. It takes about three days. We could hardly wait. We did it on the beach. In three days, we ran down and we started to try to locate it. We forgot to mark where we buried it. Oh. And we had to, we tried to dig up the whole beach trying to find it. We never did find it. Oh. <laughs> so uh, that was the that was the piece of information that we didn't pay attention to. We should have done that. Was to put a marker so we know when we come back where to get it. Bummer. Yeah. How do you, how do you mark where you bury it? Because doesn't the tide come in and out? Yeah, I just put a, a stick or some some other other way to mark the spot. Yeah. And you have to bury it where the tide comes, so that. The tide uh, washes out the the heads every what every six hours it, it goes in. Okay. So that's one of one of the important things that we knew, but we we're so excited about what we were doing. <laughs> yeah. What a disappointment. Yeah. <clears throat> My friend and I were pickling wool kelp and we thought, oh, we'll do half of them real spicy and add hot peppers. And same thing, we got all excited, halt, finished all the jars and hauled them out. And then we're like, we forgot to mark which ones are spicy. <laughs> so we didn't know. <laughs> I think I've done that too. Yeah. Um, the other uh, item that's hard to cook is... Uh, uh, gum boots. My dad used to really have. He had a handle on how to how to cook that, because if you don't cook it right, it's you absolutely cannot hardly chew on it. Mm. So, are there some um, some that are better for trading? You know, I think maybe sometimes certain. Salmon rivers will be valued more than others, or obviously certain salmon species. But then I, I also think about maybe black seaweed, you know, that could be traded. Things that are dried and stored, and then and then the value that they have, you know, to to trade. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, uh, certain uh, I had I found a happened to run across a a cassette tape and it uh <clears throat> i i didn't know what was on there so uh I, the only place we can play a cassette tape is in my my husband's old truck can play a a, a tape so i put it in started playing and here's my brother's voice my brother died in 1995 and he he said Hey Shirley, this is for you. You know, and I just did a double take. But what he did on that tape is, and I'm going to try to share it with uh, Sea Alaska, is um, uh, the, how we uh, we timed the different kinds of salmon if they came up, uh, like I think uh, the, the river that we had access to. Uh, took uh, took about three 
uh, three different kinds of salmon. Mm. So, uh, but they they don't all arrive at the same time. And that was something that he went through and explained uh, when and what to do. And uh, the uh, fish that was kind of hard, uh, the salmon that was kind of hard to use and uh, but we did use it was the dog salmon. The eggs were really excellent because they were huge mm -hmm. and the heads were wonderful. Uh, the meat, uh, if you dry it, would be uh, pretty tough, but they knew how to how to do this uh, and and the time that you get the, mm -hmm. get the, um, that dog salmon. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, my parents used to say uh, there was a certain time in the summer when you don't you don't get uh, halibut because they're too fat, too mm -hmm. much fat in them. Meat. So you just leave them alone during that time. Oh. And I forget. Sorry, I forgot when that is. That's cool. I never heard that before. Yeah. Yeah, in the summertime is when people go jigging to get a, a go to Homer and try to uh, find a, uh, somebody that'll take you for a couple hundred dollars to go jigging. Yeah. 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 Wow. We used to uh, uh, jig for halibut all the time. <clears throat> and uh, what we had was these <clears throat> um, things that my dad would make. And it, it looked, to me, it, it looked exactly like a coat hanger. Uh, and on each end would be the hooks where you put the bait. And then the part hanging in the middle is the weight. So when you uh, drop the line and you have, have it go all the way to the bottom of the, of the ocean, uh, when that rock, the weight uh, hits the ground, you lift that up a little so you're your hooks are floating just exactly at the right place. Hmm. Yeah. And my my mom used to say, you have to tell it to catch the fish and think it. Say, way the aging the good is a cow. And uh so we used to talk to the fish line for it to catch the, make sure it catches the, the uh, halibut. Can you please say that again? How, way they... Way they aging the good. That means, yeah. Uh, it's using a lot of power to get down there and and uh, to catch the, the halibut and uh, mm -hmm. And then you say the part to the halibut is jump right on it and bite it. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. I love that. I think I've heard it before and I had forgotten. Gwyneth Tiege. Yeah. Cool. I love all these discussions about the context of language. Um, I really appreciate it, Shirley, for you sharing at the level that you do. Yeah. Yeah. Well. This is awesome. I don't want to cut this short. Does anyone have any other questions or comments about our food discussion?
Okay. Um, if not, we'll move on to pronunciation practice. Um, did you have any other closing comments about foods? Uh, no, but uh, I think it's uh, wise to start looking at your diet and uh, try to imagine how it was for the old pe older people and what they did and, uh, and what they used. Nothing was wasted. Nothing. Hmm. Yeah, this discussion definitely opened my eyes about bones of animals and how much calcium we toss away if we always get boneless foods. Even the salmon that they sell and, and halibut. And I buy a halibut from the guy, I always tell him. Give me the backbone. <laughs> yeah. I can make chowder. Okay. You know, they'll, they'll cut it up the way you want, so. Oh, we have one more question in the chat. Uh, somebody asks, um, aren't there thinget potatoes? Um, not potatoes like we know it. Uh, I know we're not farmers, so mm -hmm. you know. I think some people tried to uh, to uh, grow uh, potatoes in Huna, as far as I know, and our family tried it and we got nothing. Mm -hmm. But the uh, what the thing that my brother told me about was uh, the roots. I. I think it's uh, the ferns mm. after it's full grown in the fall time you you pick the um, you dig up the the roots and uh, it's like a bunch of small carrots in the same color so you clean that off and cook it and it, it looks like and tastes like a uh, uh, yams. Mm. Yum. So those must have lots of vitamin A. Yeah. Okay. Be a really good source. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other, uh, before I forget, mm. I'm telling you about all the B vitamins. Mm -hmm. uh, the it goes all the way up to nine and then it jumps to B12 mm -hmm. and uh, B12 is extremely important because it is it only comes from a meat source so if you decide that you're going to try to be a vegetarian uh, it's a scientific diet so make sure you you get a study on how to do it Mm -hmm. uh, and make sure you have B12 because you have to have that in order to uh, for your body to keep working good. Okay. So, and they do sell B12. Okay. That's It's hard for me to imagine clink it becoming a vegetarian because we're such big meat eaters, but it does it does happen. My granddaughter mm -hmm. decided to be a, a vegan, which means that you've got to have calcium pills and you've got to have um, B12, make sure that's in the diet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, okay, excellent discussion.
So we'll switch gears here for the last few minutes of class, just so we have a variety of our discussion as well as some hands-on practice. But I do recommend, as uh, one of our classmates suggested, as you go through the Think It Foods list, you can use the dictionary, look up words, as I've sort of been doing on my screen here as we talk, and uh, let us know what you come up with. I saw some people identified suggestin for Hudson Bay tea and a couple other things. It's all really great. And so for the last few minutes of class, we'll do our pronunciation practice. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we wanted to practice some more with the X sounds. On this slide, I put this X in brackets and it looks like a beadwork design to me. But, um, oops, try not to get too... Uh, so anyway, we there are eight different ways you can read, write, and pronounce the X sounds in the Tlingit language. And it's important to pronounce them correctly and also so that you can distinguish them from each other. And so when we're hearing you read your dialogues, we wanna hear um, a difference in them. So the eight different types are what you would call it a regular X. There's no underline or pinch or rounded. That's the first one, yeah, it sounds like, yeah, just a little bit of friction in the top of your mouth. The next one's a pinched X. That's where you snap your teeth on it. it has a, It's marked by an apostrophe. So it sounds like, and uh, we'll show you examples in the next slides, but you can just repeat after me the number two. The third one is an underline X and that's any underline letter is pronounced in the back of your throat. And so an underline X will be a nice loose gravelly back of the throat sound. So repeat after me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fine if you want to stay muted. You can unmute. It's up to you guys. Um, the next one is rounded. So when I say rounded, I mean it has a W after it. And what you do is round your lips. So an XW is a rounded X. And that sounds like... Um, and then from then on, it's just a variation. It's a combination of different markings. So you can have number five is an underlined pinched X. Okay, so it's underlined. It also has an apostrophe. And then, um, so that sounds like back of the throat and pinched. You can also have a rounded and pinched. That's number six. You can have an underlined rounded. That's number seven. And then you can have a combination of all three, underlined, pinched, and rounded. That's number eight. So <clears throat> I'm just going to take you through some of the sounds that we have already seen and practiced because of our dialogue. And um, so not all of the eight X's will be represented today, but I'll take you through the ones that we do know. So first off is the regular X. We see it in a couple <coughs> of times. And you can repeat after me the top line. Good day, saya nishik. Good day, saya nishik. That sounded good. I like that that X at the end. It's so it's friction. It's a little bit of friction of your airflow in the top of your mouth. Um, everyone, repeat after me just that last word. Nishik. Nishik. Yeah. Good. And then the same uh, ending of your word in the next line, the response is repeat after me. Fred Myers, Dayan Hashik. Fred Myers, Dayan Hashik. Yeah. So you, you see in Yan Hashik, you have an underlined X in H, and then a regular X and shik. So that's good that we can hear the difference. Let's do it one more time. Fred Meyer's day on shik. 
Yeah, that was uh, that was good. Okay. Just be, be really aware every time you uh, come to an X, uh, because that's one of the things I noticed about you guys are just struggling just a little bit with the X's, keeping them all separate. And that uh, every time an X is changed, it's a different letter. So you have to keep that in mind. Okay. So um, we'll do one more and then we'll close for the day and then we'll continue this on Thursday. But the second variety is the pinched X. So it's still on the top of your mouth here, but you're closing your teeth on it. So everyone repeat after me. Scoon. 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 Yeah. And then the next line. Scoon. Gausaya. Let's do that, just that first word. Kun. 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 Yeah, that one can be tricky for folks because it's followed by that double O. Um, so you're not stopping your air, you're just pinching it. Uh, let's do it one more time. Kun. 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 How did we sound that time? Yeah, I thought I heard an underline X. Yep, that'll happen, folks. So the underline X will be back here. Um, but that's not what we're doing here. It's just pinch. So the friction is just between the top of your mouth and the top of your, or what do you call it? Yeah, roof of your mouth and top of your tongue. It's just up here and you kind of pinch it. So one more time. Un gao seya. Mm -hmm. And then better. That was better. Was that better? No, that was good. Okay. Awesome folks. Well goodness chi shati adi tsa gunas chi sha in ki niki ha it kai da chatsani ki yaiki. Awesome, folks. Thank you for your work. Thank you to Shakasani Kik for sharing with us about traditional foods. And we'll see you back here on Thursday, same time, same place. Gunachish.